All right, we start the song. Oh. Right. Right. Yeah, I hadn't heard this. In fact, oh, you, I actually know a guy in the band. Isn't that funny? Nice, nice. All right, I'm going to play a little more just because I really like it. Yeah. Just because you kind of got to hear this part. And then. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. How great is that, right? That was nice. That was nice. Right? Um, yeah. That's choice number two for anybody tuning in. Um, as we're going to do, we're going to play a variety of songs as we start our, get our podcast off the ground. And we want you to write in to tell us which one you liked, and then we'll settle on something permanent. Jeremy, you've heard two songs now. Where does that rank? That's I, That was the better of the two songs. That yeah. was the better of the two. The other one wasn't bad, right? No, it was not bad at all. What was, I, like I, I just dug that one. It, that, that was a... Uh, what, uh, like late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, not a hit by any stretch of the imagination, and you kind of wonder why, but it, uh, I just think it, it maybe was coming a little bit too far in the tail end of that whole um, new wave movement. Yeah. I just think people were getting away from it, but it's a real good contender. I, I honest to God, record it four years earlier, that's a hit. Did Pat Benatar sing the hook on that? That's right. Nice, 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 nice here. Okay, good. Yeah, nice here. But like I don't I said, know if they sampled it or, or they just had her sing the hook. I don't know. No, no, no. She sang it. Um, oh, nice. Like I said, a buddy of mine who now he works in a record shop now, but back then he was the bassist. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, you're not famous. You're the bassist, but still, that's cool. Hey, man, you're in the band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And now he works at a record shop and, and uh, <laughs> well, and then now he doesn't work at a record shop because it's all closed down. But yeah. hypothetically, if that record shop comes back, he still has a job. So. That's nice. That's nice. All right, everybody. Welcome to Good Science, Bad Science. Um, uh, episode two. I am one of your hosts, Jim Bruce, and this is Jeremy Paul. Hey, everybody. Uh Something very nice happened last episode. Hold on. Something very nice happened last episode, which was I just asked a question and it suggested a topic for our second episode. I was very happy with how that turned out. And so the question was, um, is a virus alive? And we were talking about COVID-19 because that's the most popular virus right now. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. the virus de jour. Um, and we were talking about it and Jeremy's gut reaction is the same as my gut reaction when I was first thinking about this. Well, of course it's alive. It self-replicates. Right. It does all that stuff. But according to science, no, it is not. It is in a, it is in a gray area. Uh, to be fair, there are some scientists who, who do say that it's living. And they, yeah. base their, they base their opinion on a particular definition of life. But most scientists say that it is not alive. And I'm going to tell you why a virus isn't alive. And then I'm going to kind of throw it to Jeremy. So this is what most scientists say. And an important part of science is before you embark on a experiment to test a theory, before you embark on... Uh, even just constructing a theory, you have to have a baseline agreement on definitions. Just what is a thing first? And, yeah. uh, and that, by the way, sparked so much interesting thoughts on my part. I hope you enjoy this episode. But number one, um, a virus is not self-replicating all by itself. It can't self-replicate. It's not composed of cells. It's a small amount of genetic information. And it can do nothing on its own without hijacking the machinery of another living cell. Essentially what it does is when it gets inside your body, it tricks some of your cells into doing work for it. But all by itself, 
it can't generate. And once it's done that work, it's not like it can leave the body. So it's not like a parasite because a parasite can live in your body, like say a worm in your stomach, but it can also live outside your body for a while and either find a new host or eventually die or any, depending upon what the, vi what the parasite is, sometimes it can live outside the body after it's consumed, you know, whatever it's going to take from you, like a baby. Right. Um, but, <laughs> but, a, but a virus doesn't have the machinery and doesn't have internal stability, uh, cannot generate its own energy. So that's why would we'll say the most scientists who study this question of when does life begin, what is life, um, you know, who do uh, chemistry and those kinds of experiments, they say it's not alive. Um, what did you think when you were doing the research this week? And to share me your, th your thoughts, Jeremy. Well, I went through a, a different sort of tact because I knew you were going to attack it from, from the angle of pure science. Sure. Right. Like I started, of course, you have to start with how life began on the planet in the first place. Like the first living cell. Uh, let me look over here on a, uh, cause I have to spell it out. Pro, pro, car, pro prokaryotes was right. a living cell, single celled organism from 4 billion years ago. So that's the beginning of life. So if a single celled organism lacking a cell membrane is the first life, then we have to assume that life begins at the first cell. Okay, so here's, that's an interesting, so that's why it's a gray area, because you can say, but, so you say, prior to that moment, it, there was no life, and then after that moment, but if you acknowledge there's a border, then you can debate where the border is, right? Yeah. Because Similar to, say, the start of the universe, which we talked about last time with um, steady state theory and the Big Bang theory, if you're acknowledging the existence of a border, then, it's, then we can debate where the border really belongs. If right. there's no border, like if you're just like, there always was life, then, okay, then all things are living. But if there wasn't always life, um, so the scientific answer, well, I shouldn't say that because some scientists disagree, but a lot of people say maybe that's not quite life, but a lot uh -huh. of people, the thing about viruses that make other people say it's alive is the fact that it does evolve. Viruses yeah. absolutely evolve and they evolve in record time compared to say far more complex organisms like you and I hypothetically our species is evolving but mm -hmm. there's even some debate about whether or not we've drunk we've jumped the tracks as far as evolution goes considering how much we manipulate our environment because of course you know, primary the primary driver of evolution is your environment if you take over your environment and you're the pressure then the question of are we under the same pressures that made us primates and the answer is probably no, then it's even a question as to whether or not we're even fucking evolving at this point. It sure don't seem like it from what I've seen on TV. Um, <laughs> so, so you would say a virus is alive, right? Yeah, mainly because uh, most viruses, and I, I, I don't know too much about viruses because I didn't finish that chapter when I before I before I dropped out of med school, yeah. uh, <laughs> pre med I should say not med school. Uh, but um, most most viruses that I've ever known of have have a hint of DNA. Yes, they, and if it has DNA, then it has ribosomes, and if it has ribosomes, that means it transmits information. So they have to be alive. Well. I'm not sure they actually have DNA. We'll have to look it up. I think they have RNA. I think mm. it's RNA, which uh, DNA is alive. RNA, not so much, but also RNA may be where DNA springs from, in which yeah. case it's, it's a weird gray area. And that's, that's the fascinating part about it is good science, bad science is you have to start 
from an agreed set of truths. Like you and I, if we're in a laboratory and we're, we're speculating on how life might have emerged, uh, because they still, really, that question is still unanswered. The true moment is there's good theories, primordial soup theories. There's experiments that have been done in the lab. The problem, of course, is in a lab, it's very difficult to replicate the conditions of an early Earth. I would say probably actually impossible. Very only yeah. in large part to the fact that we can't even entirely define the absolute conditions under which we're talking about. But see, I, I tend to emotionally, I got to say emotionally, I feel like a virus is alive. I feel like emotionally, I'm like, it seems like it's doing all this stuff that a non-living thing can't do. Like a rock can't yeah. do the thing that a virus is doing. A rock can't, impart any information even to another rock. It's just an inert bit of matter. Oddly enough though, that damn rock has all this stuff in it that without which there couldn't be a Jeremy. Yeah, and That's odd. There's minerals and things that if they didn't occur in an inert sense, couldn't have been in a uh, living sense. So it's a peculiar question about when does it cross over, which opens up another question. If you're asking the question, when does life begin? Is that good science or bad science? What do you think? Well, it's good science, but uh, because nobody can... Nobody can agree on a set set time or a, a set, philosophically speaking, they can't agree when it begins. Like you, you read the religious books. Uh, I, I actually have to go through and, and read a bunch of stuff for this because I was, I was interested, like when, did, when do various religions believe that life begins? Uh, like, uh, where does it say, uh, in Judaism, you got to be alive for 30 days for you to be truly considered living. Yep. Right? So that's because back in those days, you know, they they didn't know if you were going to live 30 days or not. So they didn't consider you they didn't consider you living until you had lived a month. Yeah. In the Bible it says uh what uh, life begins when God blew breath into Adam's lungs. Right. So until you take your first breath, you're not living. So uh, what, what was it? The last one, uh, Islam. Uh, each one of you is con constituted in the womb of the mother for 40 days. So until a woman is pregnant for 40 days, you're not living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Islam. So and what was the, uh, what's the old philosophical quote? I think, therefore I am. So until you have your first thought, you're not living. Yeah. So everybody has a different philosophical slant about when life begins. And science is telling us when you transmit information. When, when a cell transmits information, that's when life begins. And when it's self-contained. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another part of it, one of the reasons why a virus, by many accounts, isn't living is because it's not, it's not self-contained. It doesn't, yeah. um, it won't, a virus all by itself won't make other viruses. It won't, it'll just live or die. Yeah. But it won't. But also, once you introduce the idea of it being dead, then you've kind of acknowledged that it was alive. Um, so, so then here's my cursory response is I think mostly the question of when does life begin in a like, not even in a human being, but I mean, when did life start is in my mind currently bad science, good philosophy. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like Science currently isn't now, but now, of course, I bet there's somebody in a lab, a lab somewhere doing really good science to ask this question. But I think mostly it's good questions, but it's not good science yet because you don't have an experiment yet to produce life from nothing, which is kind of what you need to do, right? At least define 
an experiment that could do that. Yeah. Because that's got to be the, the idea is it doesn't have to come from no matter. You can take inert matter and somehow pop life into it. But until you can do an experiment that allows you to produce that tiny little organism that, you know, going from an amino acid to something that's actually alive, then to me, it's bad science. That's what I think. It's a good question. It's like string theory. I've mentioned this before. String theory is mostly not great science. There's right. some good science there, but there's so little there's so little that it predicts there's so little ways to get around testing it that some mm -hmm. physicists don't even consider it a legitimate part of physics. There's yeah. a very passionate, intelligent, uh, science minded people who want it to be, but listen, <laughs> until, until Einstein could test general relativity, it was just a thing he thought. Right. Until, you could actually test it and go, oh, look, here's a set of predictions. And now those predictions are true. But until then, as much as you may like Einstein, it wasn't good science. It was good math, uh -huh. it was good theory, but it really hadn't produced results. So that's what you need, I think. Uh, the, uh, there was another thing I read uh, uh, regarding this where it's said that, um, uh, a cell, it, a, what, what was it? A virus can't become, isn't, isn't considered living until it is capable of functioning or be, becoming complex, like an atom or a cell or right. bacteria, right? Yeah. Until it, like I think you, it, like you intimated on it, is like until it becomes, it's able to build upon itself. So until it's able to evolve, it's not alive. Yeah. Yes. And to a degree, it does evolve because obviously we have COVID-19 right. because it was something else and it made a jump, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't make itself like, you know, my body, your body is filled with all these cells and all this machinery uh -huh. that generates its own thing that re, you know, I'm regenerating cells all the time. It's no wonder right. I'm tired. <laughs> a uh, uh, virus won't do that. Um, so from a practical standpoint, I, I think we talked about this too, is that the question is more important to the person who's trying to run an experiment because you want to establish boundaries. So for the sake of this experiment, it's not life. For the sake of this experiment, it is life. And it is all right to play around with definitions as long as we all agree on why we're calling a thing, you know, one thing or the other. Like, talked about Pluto. The reason Pluto is not a planet is because um, ast uh, astrophysicists realized that if you called Pluto a planet, then it would turn out that our solar system is filled with like 90 to 100 planets. Yeah. There's there's even other things that we know aren't planets or that we've never called a planet that are bigger than Pluto in our own solar system. So that's yeah. why they took that definition and went, no, actually for very practical reasons, Pluto is not a planet. And for, I guess, practical reasons on what it is you're trying to establish, a virus just isn't life. But I'll tell you, if you read the papers, I mean, the peer reviewed papers, it's not settled. That's what I find that interesting. I find it interesting that it's not a settled question. Certain questions are settled. That's not. Um, and if I, I'm going to go on a little tangent I read about. Uh, this led me down a path because I, I find this kind of stuff interesting. Are you familiar with spontaneous generation? You familiar with that? Uh, yes, I've heard. So speaking of good science, bad science, and this would be uh, bad science, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, 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 sometimes called Aristotelian uh, uh, abogenesis, which is the idea that was believed for a very long time that life generated spontaneously. 
Um, do you remember the experiment they used to prove it? No, no. Okay, so this is how they established. The idea was they thought at one point for the longest time that life would just spontaneously generate in much the same way it'll, it is alleged to have done in Genesis. And they, what they did is they took a piece of bread and they left it out and mold developed on the bread. Uh -huh. After mold developed, maggots developed on the bread. <laughs> they said the maggots spontaneously generate. And then right. <laughs> flies appeared. Flies <laughs> appeared. <laughs> and the, for the longest time, that was the general understanding of life that it just spontaneously generated. <laughs> and it wasn't until Louis Pasteur and Francesco Red Eye, uh, those are two key guys who disproved spontaneous generation. But I gotta tell you, uh, Francesco Red Eye uh, didn't uh, absolutely challenge it hardcore. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he was afraid of the church. This is true. Yeah, much, yeah. much like the way our solar system is set up, the church had a vested interest in spontaneous generation. So it was, uh -huh. it was uh, considered uh, blasphemous to some degree to suggest <laughs> that maggots weren't appearing by magic. Oh, uh, yeah. The church, church stopped a lot of good science back then. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> So what he did to prove, to disprove a uh, spontaneous generation and Louis Pasteur did a similar experiment. Louis Pasteur gets most of the credit, but they both did a very similar set of experiments. They took uh, rotting meat, put it in a jar and they left the jar open and they put rotting meat and they left it in a jar and they left it covered with basically uh, porous material, but that wouldn't let mm -hmm. anything in. So oxygen could get in, but nothing else. And then they corked one and they had all this rotting meat. I have to tell you that lab probably smelled like shit. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did these experiments and basically what happened is exactly what we now intuitively know would happen. The meat that was uncovered, some fly went and had, went to town on that rotten meat. Yeah. And a fly that nobody saw went and dined, you know, said, hey, open, this restaurant's open. Let's go eat at this place. And they went and did their business. And then maggots appeared and then flies appeared. But the meat that was in a container that was covered with a non-porous, with a porous material, it, it went bad. It rotted. It still wasn't, still don't, don't eat it, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, but no maggots. And then the one that was covered completely, it still probably wasn't that good. But no, you couldn't, you couldn't barbecue it. Yes, it degenerated at a much more seriously slow pace. And this just shows you some of the limitations of science because the problem was they did not have a theory of the small. There just <laughs> wasn't, microorganisms didn't really exist back then. I mean, they existed. Yeah. Not as far as anybody was concerned. Right, because they didn't, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have the high power microscopes that we do. Yeah. So. And they didn't. Um, they never intuited it. There's a problem with primates. Us being such self. It's funny because we're so self-centered. Uh -huh. Number one, of course, the Earth is the center of the universe. We're here. But also, number two, I can't see it. I don't even know what you're talking about because it doesn't affect me, even though you can, you can imagine inv invisible God, but you <laughs> can't for some reason conceive of these microorganisms so very small that you can't see them having any bearing on your life. And yet, of course, they destroyed entire Roman armies. <laughs> they done much worse for the longest amount of time. So no theory of the small. Uh, related, uh, are you familiar with the first uh, doctor who ever thought to wash his hands? 
oh, I know this. But yes, I'm familiar with it. I just can't remember his name. Neither can I, but it's a funny story. So back in the old days, uh, doctors didn't bother washing their hands because why would you? Uh -huh. um, you're too busy. You got surgery. So right. what would happen is they'd be doing surgery on, say, a cadaver. Uh -huh. And then they'd wipe their hands off, and then they'd go deliver a baby. Right. And then they'd <laughs> probably go have a sandwich. And uh -huh. other things. And babies died at a rate they were comfortable with, which was probably 50-50, I'm guessing. <laughs> uh -huh. now, also the then, mothers as well. Yes, absolutely. Back then, they had a thing called midwives, which we still have now. And this was before midwives became witches. <laughs> uh, this one midwives, and this one doctor noticed that midwives, uh, when they helped a woman give birth in her home, had a better success rate in the mother and the baby surviving. And as a doctor, he found that weird. He thought, well, I have, I have a surgeon's table. I've been trained in a, in a university. I know all this stuff. Why are they able to produce a, a healthy baby and I'm not at the same rate? And he just put his mind to it and was fairly scientific minded and thoughtful. And he thought, well, what's different? And he thought, well, it's the other stuff I'm doing. It's got to be the other stuff I'm doing. So what he did is he decided, I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to wash <laughs> my hands after everything I do. And he was considered outrageous. The idea, <laughs> the idea oh, my God, I can't believe you're, you maniac washing your hands. So he washes his hands. And lo and behold, now – the amount of successful births he has is now better than the midwives because now his medical expertise combined with soap and water uh -huh. has made him successful. And then he started boiling his instruments. Lo and behold, people started surviving more. Yeah. And so he's the guy who started uh, producing a theory of the small and making some headway and not being called crazy. <laughs> you know, that's that's why they blame Jews back in the black in the Black Plague, because they were surviving and nobody else was. It all all it was was they washed their hands. <laughs> so that's all it was. Like everybody else was dirty motherfuckers. <laughs> Couldn't think to wash their damn hands. Well, you know, in Chicago the great city of Chicago, Illinois, where I used to live, and I believe you've been to Chicago. Uh-huh. Um, Chicago, uh, during the, around the turn of the century, uh, a lot of people were dying. Uh, and they were, and they were dying because they were just getting sick, everybody getting the same kind of sickness. But for some reason, a lot of the dock workers and a lot of the, like, just, you know, blue-collar dudes we're not dying. And everyone's right. like, what the fuck are they doing? Why are they not dying? It turned out it was because they were drinking beer. They <laughs> drank a lot of beer. And what was that beer doing? It was killing the microorganisms in the filthy water everybody was drinking. Yeah. <laughs> so it pointed everybody in the right direction to go, hey, maybe our drinking water and our toilet water shouldn't be mixing <laughs> Maybe <laughs> shouldn't be the case and it pointed people in the right right direction so getting back to good science bad science when when folks thought that the, that life was generating spontaneously on uh -huh. a piece of bread in one sense it was good science because they were asking all the questions where does life come from why does life appear on this piece of bread? What's going on here? They're asking all the questions. But the other question you have to ask as a scientist was a question they didn't know to ask, which is, what don't I know? That's the most mm. important question a scientist could ask. Is, yeah. where's my pocket of ignorance? Because they didn't have a theory of the small. So they really, there was no chance of Aristotle realizing 
there were these tiny things. There just wasn't a chance he was ever going to do it. So in a, in a certain way, you could say it's, it's good science up to a point, which is, well, they did experiments. You know, you started with thought experiments, and then you actually moved on to laboratory experiments. Yeah. But you didn't do what they would do in a lab now, which is think about what do I need to eliminate that is going to skew my results? So that's the question they didn't ask. That's, that's actually a heavy question. Yeah. Huh. Right? No, I'm, <laughs> now you got me thinking about that. I, I spend a lot of my time in my day, and I advise anybody to do this. That's... Just ask yourself, what am I being dumb about? Because you can do it in interpersonal relationships too. You know, like you can have a buddy that you're mad at. You know, I've certainly had this. I'm a short tempered Irish idiot. <laughs> um, and you can ask, and you can be mad at somebody. And then you, but ask yourself, what is it about, what a piece of information don't I have? Right. That might lead me to a different conclusion, uh, a conclusion of compassion or even a conclusion of self-recrimination where you suddenly go, oh, shit, this is my fault. <laughs> you know? Right. I've certainly done that where I'm like, oh, I, you know what? I think I might be the dick here. Um, and in science, the question you should be asking yourself, Feynman asked this question all the time, which is why every physicist respects him. Yeah. He asked the question, what biases am I bringing here? And am I even asking the right questions? You know, right. when, when does life begin is a good question. Maybe it's not the right question. Maybe, maybe you start with the real question, which is the question we started with. What is life? Yeah. And then because where does life begin is meaningless until you define it. Uh -huh. It's fucking worthless to ask a question about a term you haven't even defined. If Agreed. you ask, where does life begin? And then you, you're fucking still haggling over the definition. You're nine steps ahead of yourself. No. You know? Like this, there's, so, there's so much to, to the question about where life begins. Because it, it's... I think that's that's the question that we've all been asking ourselves because eventually it gets to to, to be the uh, the ultimate question of what is the meaning of life? That's the end question. You go from how does life begin to what is the meaning of the life that began? Well, I'll tell you, do you know what Feynman would say about that question? What is the meaning of life? He would say, now granted, he's a much smarter, hardcore scientist than you and I will ever be. Uh -huh. he would say that that's a worthless question. I wouldn't say that because I find the question of us personally seeking meaning a good yeah. question. But, there, but that's a good thing to point out about good science, bad science. What is the meaning of life is a question that Monty Python can ask. It's a question uh -huh. that you can ask. It's a question that my rabbi or your pastor or you know somebody else's cleric can ask. But it's a question a scientist can never ask. You, a scientist will never, right. never be able to, to provide meaning. Right. Mainly because it, it, would, it interferes with fact. And because, I'll tell you the other thing. Let's get back to this. Mm -hmm. Define meaning. I don't think you can. Exactly. I mean, you can, you can get close. I don't even think I could really give you a clear definition of what meaning is just for me. Like yeah. I can say, you know, so as an example, I can say that love brings my life meaning. I can say that, but then I, I sure as shit can't even really define love particularly well. And if I get into all the characteristics that I would use to define love, 
I guarantee you I'll use 10 examples that are also poorly defined. Right. Because if I would say to you, love is compassionate, well, fucking define compassion. And I <laughs> guarantee you, you're going to struggle because it's conditional. It's uh, situational. I mean, look at the Bible. In the Bible, the Bible is said to be this moral book. And it's by people who believe in it, they believe it contains absolute morals. Absolute. Uh -huh. Part of its absolute morals is teaching you how to treat a slave well. Yeah. It doesn't tell you not to have slaves. Yeah. In the time in which it was written, I guess if you were a slave, you were like, ah, oh, finally, somebody's treating us well. You probably <laughs> thought, fuck yeah, great. That's progress of a kind. But yeah. it's not absolute. And as much as, as much as you may love the Bible and it's a fine book that's contributed certainly to our advancement as a species, it's currently interfering. And yeah. the Bible doesn't even define murder very well. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells you do not murder, thou shalt not kill, but it actually, the proper definition is thou shalt not murder. Yeah. But it also gives you a lot of leeway in people you can kill. Uh -huh. It gives you conditions under which thou shalt not murder. By the way, if you kill this dude, that ain't murder. Like, stoning isn't technically murder. <laughs> yeah, because, so. yeah, or this enemy from this other village, not you can kill them, you can kill their women, or you can have them. Yeah. Depends, situationally. Situational ethics is all over the fucking map in there. <laughs> so when we talk about a question like, um, what makes life meaningful? That's just not a scientific question. It just isn't, it isn't a question you can ask in a valid way. You can, it's a philosophical question yeah. that remains very difficult to answer, but it's still a very good question to ask as a person. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's good to challenge your mind and the fact that like, I want to think on a plane where maybe I can figure this out where others haven't. Yeah. Whereas science will tell you, well, meaning isn't worth. Yeah. Meaning can be worth, but it isn't. Like you were saying, love makes my life meaningful. But that's the worth yeah. of your life is love. But yeah. that is always a static definition of love or life. Yeah. Right? So where you come in with the science, uh, as far as uh, evaluating what life is, there's no known math to evaluate life. Yeah. Right? So sure. we're, stuck with, we're stuck with what we know, which is what constitutes life. Well, what constitutes life is cells, the amount of cells. The amount of complex cells is the value of life. Yeah. Right. And that's what we end up being stuck at. We're like, all right, we know at least this much. We know that a that a protozoa isn't isn't the same as a uh, as a as a, a, a three tiered cell. We know that, so we're we're just going with all right. Well, what's the worth? A human is worth more than a than a than a uh, than a platypus. <laughs> I guess that's because we have more complex cells. And the interesting thing is. That's not objectively true. That's an interesting question because I will tell you that I feel pretty valuable. Uh -huh. But I guarantee you there's flora and fauna that are in an objective sense more valuable than you or I. Yes. More value than every, every stupid human being on this planet. Uh -huh. Because number one, without them, number one, I couldn't exist. Uh -huh. And the other animals couldn't either. So in an objective sense, I, Richard, uh, I think it's Richard Harris or is it Sam Harris? Sam Harris suggests, and by the way, for anybody listen, I know he's kind of a prick, but <laughs> you don't have to tell me that. But he is an interesting thinker. And he speculated that there might be something 
we might act science might actually be able to answer the question of science might be able to speculate and maybe even produce a set of ethics that were objective if and again it gets down to definitions it gets down to first defining ethics and defining uh -huh. the fundamental principles that you would be defending but if there were ob objective ethics there would be parts of them you'd find really unpleasant if they <laughs> really existed because there would be a set of conditions under which you'd go well the ethical thing here would be to let under a certain if this set of thing if these things happen it's time to, to let the human species go because that might and that that truth might exist it would just be a cold unpleasant truth there might be a greater good that just doesn't include us because if the greater good is let's say let's say it is objectively true that uh and ethically good whatever good means and now we'd have to just we'd have to define good um, and we'd have to define you know ethics in a way that was objective and we'd say okay we all agree there could be a condition under which you're like well because what we're saying is good has to do with the propagation of life at this point humanity's now become a hindrance and it's time to move on to the next species because that uh -huh. could be the great truth the great truth could be every era has a species that belongs to its era like say the jurassic era but uh -huh. there's a time when it's like you're done you can exit you can exit over there you're no longer needed but what that means is <clears throat> oh our time on the stage is almost over <laughs> yeah <clears throat> and if you believed that good was first definable and worthy you'd have to go well then it's a fine and good thing that humanity has done now to be honest i kind of do believe that i do believe that it's fine that we will come to an end as a species i've <clears throat> it's because that just does appear to be how it works uh -huh. no use getting upset about it that by the way i said this last time and i'll probably say this a lot i find science comforting because for for reasons that religion was never able to do for me because science lets me know that number one my <sighs> death my death is just part of the system yeah so there's nothing for me to be upset about my mother's death part of the <clears throat> system and um the unnecessary suffering like say the holocaust that's not part of the system that's not nature that's mm -hmm. us being d-bags to each other yeah that's that's uh and, yeah and if you understand the system you can still say nope that's wrong trail of tears that's wrong we're all alive for a finite time that's just the system. Hey, don't be a prick. Because we're all just trying to get through. Yeah. That's all we're, any of us are trying to do. We're trying to get, we're trying to have lunch. <laughs> trying to take, all my fucking life, when you boil down to what is life? Life is having lunch now and then. Uh huh. Uh, hanging out with friends. Uh huh. And some good lady going, all right, you can climb on top of me for a little bit. Right. Or a nice fellow saying to a lady, sure, you can climb on top of me. That's all. Everything else, is <laughs> Everything else is just the little details that we fight about. But, you know, like... Living in pursuit of pleasure. Yep. Yeah, and really, let other people be. Because their yeah. time here is finite as well. Uh -huh. um, some people's time on earth we can all agree should probably be more finite <laughs> but <laughs> yeah like there's a we we uh like the i've told you about the book i've been writing right yes now there's a philosophy behind the book um it's the the purpose behind the book is that uh one every person uh has possibility of being able to do one special thing right 
Yeah. So like uh, the man that invented paper, the, <laughs> like the, there was one man that had actually invented paper. It was a man in China in 126 BC, invented the paper that we use now. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, there was a war for 700 years. So uh, people were fighting China to discover how to make paper. That's for crazy. 700 years, and until uh, I think what is now Kyrgyzstan, uh, people kidnapped two paper makers from China, and that's how the rest of the world got paper. Okay. So be that's the basis of what I've been writing. It's like, all right, so one person was able to change the world with this one invention, because without that, without that man, we don't have like we would have we would have had. We couldn't use papyrus forever. We couldn't use stone tablets forever. But this guy discovered how to make paper. And because of that, we have information. We have everything else that we depend on because of this one man. Well, at the end of the day, my, my, my character in my book, uh, she sees part of the, she becomes, an, she's not becomes, but she's an immortal because she, in her mind, uh, like it's just perfect, perfect genetics, right? Yeah. So it becomes perfect genetics, and I, I postulate in the book, it's like we know that we we like to believe that everything dies, that there's an end to everything, but how are we supposed to know that if we don't have all the information, and if there's one person or one thing on this planet that doesn't die, how will you ever know? True. Right? I, the one way you would know is that person, over time, you're going to go, damn, they're short. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there were actual, like, uh, people in tribes that made it to, you know, five, three, five, four. Right. So she'd be average, right? Yeah, she'd be uh, an average woman. But at the time... At when she was born, when she was young, let's say when she was like 20, she was fucking tall. Yeah, she's a fucking giant. Uh, <laughs> but, that's funny. But be, like, so. Hey, hold on. I'm going to let yeah. you continue, but uh, I'm going to tell you the topic for episode three. Okay. I just got it from you. Okay. What we're going to talk about to start off our conversation next week is the fight over uh clear glass because oh, nice. by the way it's very similar to the story of paper it was the discovery of glass and the ability to make clear glass specifically that led to like microscopes and glasses yep um that was a state secret where it was discovered it was the technology and similar to paper, without it, there's so much of what we, so that's episode three. Now continue okay. what you were saying. Good, right? Yeah, that's actually a, a good topic. My, yeah, my goal, I'm gonna try to find the topic for next episode, <laughs> in our current episode. That's a fun little trick, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay, fun. I like it. But uh, as far as, as, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, so we were t you were talking about this woman who's immortal because and then she would be the example of uh because everybody else speculates that life may or may end at some point but how the hell do you know when you're dumb 70 years right so in in the book or even in my head because there's that's where it's all coming from anyway sure, sure. uh <laughs> it like the way i have it planned out is that uh she she comes to a number like that she's one and one nine one nine alien of, <laughs> of of life like everything had a special thing but she was the one that lived forever like there was a one uh what's the uh like what the worst year in recorded history right she in in the book she lives through the worst year in recorded history which is 536 ad i don't know if you know about like the worst year of recorded history. I don't uh, know. There was, there was a volcano that erupted in, uh, they believe, uh, Iceland or, 
or in uh, somewhere in northern uh, Canada by by uh, Alaska and one that erupted in Central America, right? It was such a, a big blast that it covered the entire world. Okay, yes. Okay, would this be Pompeii as well or no? No, no, no. This was, it was such a huge blast that it darkened the world for a year. Wow. So for a year, there was, there was no, there was, the crops died, everything died. <laughs> like the temperature dropped, I think, four degrees worldwide. Uh, and all of this because a couple of volcanoes erupted like a year apart. So she lived through this and this, like all it takes is one thing to, to change the course of history, yeah. to change life on this planet. And she's the one life that lived forever. And that's, that's basically the, 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 I guess, there's a lot of science that I've poured into this book, which is why it's taken me so long. <laughs> like I've been writing this thing for damn near 12 years. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I don't want to give away all the science. No, no, don't. So, but if, if you think about it, one in one nine alien, right? One person or one living organism out of one in one nine alien. That's, that's a huge drop. I don't know if you know how, how big of a number one nine, not one nine alien is. It's, it's like 900, uh, what's, what's the 900 X billion or not one, nine, 900, one, you have a billion, it's 900 billions. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a lot of living organisms in that time. But the reason why I bring that up, my whole book is because of, uh, the way that she witnessed life ending for humanity. Oh, cool. This will, this is something I'll give away about the book uh, because it's, it's how I, how I figure life is going to end in the first place. Uh, it's not by comet like the, or asteroid like the, like the, like the dinosaurs. It's not even going to be by super volcano. All it is, is going to be air poisoning. <laughs> Slow choking. Yeah, I could yeah. see that. I could see uh, it. Because we've always, we, I think we've already lost helium. I think the, the atmosphere is uh, depleted of helium. And a lot of people that don't know science or the science of air uh, are under the belief that we we're just breathing oxygen. They don't realize we're, we're mainly breathing nitrogen. Uh, <laughs> so if they don't know that much, they don't know that uh, if helium goes away, then nitrogen increases. Uh, they, they don't know we're screwed because uh, we're going to die of, of air poisoning. <laughs> probably in the next four or 500 years. Uh, so that's how I have us all dying in the book. And I just find that hilarious. That's pretty awesome. Hey, so this suggests a question I've asked myself and then I'll ask you, I'll tell you my answer and then you tell me your answer. Okay. You're hanging around with your dumb friends and you're just chatting about philosophy or whatever. Somebody invariably, somebody will say, um, if you could live forever, what would you do? And my answer is always, if I knew I was going to live forever, I would try to figure out how to kill myself. <laughs> fuck that. I personally, this is the way I see it. The way I see it is one of the best parts of life for me is that I know this shit is finite. Yeah. Um, I think the amount of time that a human being is alive on, let's say on the far end, you know, somebody who lives to be 120, 130, and they're always somebody in a small village who used to pick coffee beans or whatever. And you're like, I don't know why they're still alive. I think that's about the most I would ever want. I don't even think I'd want that much. Uh. I think, I think dogs are nailing it. I think, you know, like the average good dog, and I love dogs, live to be like 12 or 14. And it's always very sad when they die. But it's always fucking 14 great ass years. Uh -huh. I've never, I've never met somebody yet who was 90 
and thought to myself, ooh, they haven't even peaked yet. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> so first, the first thing I want to say is I would never want to live forever. I just wouldn't. That sounds like a goddamn nightmare. Um, second of all, um, I, so when you ask, so I guess when, when you were asked that question, would you really want it? It's okay Me? if your answer yes. is yes. Oh yeah, I definitely want to live forever. Mm. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I write the book. Like I want, I want to envision everything that could happen uh, even depending on the past, the things that have happened. I definitely, but there's a catch. I don't want to just live for like age forever. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be 90 years old in a, in a 90, 90 year old's body, like 90 year old human body. I don't want that. Yeah. Like, hey. if, I, if I had to encase my body in a robot, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> Here's a thought experiment for you. You ready? Imagine, uh -huh. Imagine you could live forever, right? Uh -huh. And our species died off, right? But yeah. another species started, and they were close enough, right? They're primate, they're bipedal, and you could fit in reasonably. And language evolved, so you're like, okay, cool. Now I can talk to these fuckers again. That's great. And then how surprised would you be? You know, it's, you've thousands and thousands of years of this tens of thousands of years, a million years, this new species yeah. develops and you can kind of fit in. How surprised would you be if at some point you're like, huh, they also invented dubstep. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought I survived this, but nope, they brought it right. And it's, and it's the only thing you have in common from one species to the other, like, why the fuck is that the universal truth? Dubstep. Oh, hey, maybe man. it is. Maybe we're onto something. Maybe dubstep is the only universal truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would teach them so much music. <laughs> it's like, please, let's, let's, I know we have, bah, 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 bah. You, you get that yet? Did you get, bah, 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 bah? no, just, just loud screeches and dubstep. Thank you fucking shitty humanoids and <laughs> subhumans. Because then your idea of living forever, you'd go, ah, this is not worth it. This is yeah, not I, I would find a nice secluded corner of the planet <laughs> and go there. You know, the thing that made me think about that is when you think about the creatures that do live a long time, like turtles, Yeah. you know, if you buy a turtle, uh, depending upon what kind of turtle, there are people who own turtles who have to put the turtle in their will so yeah. that somebody else will take care of the turtle. Uh -huh. Turtles can live hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. But what the fuck for? <laughs> what are you doing? You're a turtle. How could this possibly, how could it have been, there's, you're not doing stuff as a turtle that made it worth it. <laughs> turtles mean, and parrots. Yeah, turtles and parrots. There's stuff, I, you know, there's a turtle that for sure, its first 20 years, it saw some fucking horrible shit. Uh -huh. that it didn't know how to process, like the way that we do, right? Like it saw a gazelle just somehow get the drop on like a tiger and rape the tiger. <laughs> and it saw it. And it, it only happened that one time, and it was a gazelle that was like, I'm never going to get to do this again, and this is for my brothers, and it's going to do it. <laughs> and that turtle saw that shit and then lived 500 years not being able to tell anybody about it, not being able to get therapy. The fuck is that about? Uh -huh. And if I lived, if I lived to be 500 years old, 500 years old, that's 500 years where for the whole time, I'm never going to be able to tell you why the fuck they couldn't come up with a good ending to Lost, for example. <laughs> it's still going to haunt me. I'm never going to get closure on that. But 
if I die at 120, I'm going to go, all right, that's fine that I had to watch Lost. That's fine. I'm glad I never started watching that show. Because <laughs> yeah. so many people are disappointed. And I'm like, man. Yeah. Can I tell you the best way to watch Lost, if you ever want to take it up, watch arbitrary random episodes not in order. And it's kind of like watching um, – it's kind of like Twin Peaks then because uh -huh. it doesn't make sense, but the acting and the dialogue's enjoyable. So if you watch Lost in no particular order, it's a good show. If you watch it the way they intended you to watch it, no. no. So it's like, it's like uh, season six of Night Court instead of season eight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Out of order, just some nonsense. And you're like, because then you can make up your own story and you can imagine there's a point. Which brings us back to life. Life yeah. works as long as you can just imagine there's a point. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else is on your mind, my friend? Uh, well, we uh, pretty much covered everything. I think so, too. I, I liked it. We got episode three, something to think about, something to read yeah. about, something to spark other thoughts. Uh, good science, bad science. Um, Jeremy, I uh, bit, almost had to cancel because uh, something nice was going to happen. I hope it happens. <laughs> no, my, my cousin's home now, so, you know, that, uh, okay. that ship has sailed. <laughs> yeah, something nice happened to me last weekend. So. Oh, nice. It was great. Glad that. Yeah, it was very oh, nice. Shit. She already told. She already texted me to let me know that uh, she's playing Fortnite now, so it's over. This is a. Uh, That's awesome. Yep. This, this is the kind of women I end up with. So I'm gonna do something different for the closing. Here's what I'm uh, gonna do. Uh huh. I'm not gonna play any more of that song. I'm gonna play a cover of that song. Oh, so nice. Because. I'm not always a big fan of covers. Let me know what you think of this because I think it's kind of interesting, but most of the time I don't like covers. Uh -huh. This one, I, I was like, okay, this is interesting. So let's play this. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Huh. All right, that, that, that guy is off tune. I know, right? I know. It's funny to me. I, I'm like, I don't know why this even exists. Yeah. Like, is this on YouTube? You, yeah, you can find it. Look it up. Look it up. It's... Like, oh, man. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I, I hope he has... I hope he does covers and they're all like this. <laughs> yeah. Right? Just because it's fucking batshit insane. Holy right. shit. Did he just try to hit the, the fucking same? Oh, god damn. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. This is good science, bad science, or bad science, good science. I can't remember what we called it. But regardless, it's good science, bad science. Jim Bruce. Jerry Paul. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>